Asatoma Sakamaya Asatoma Sakamaya Tamasoma Joy Tigamaya Tamasoma Joy Tigamaya Richoma Amritam Gamaya Richoma Amritam Gamaya Together Asatoma Sakamaya Tamasoma Joy Tigamaya Nishyama Amritangamaya Asatoma Sakamaya Tamasoma Joy Tigamaya Nishyama Amritangamaya Asatoma Sakamaya Tamasoma Joy Tigamaya Mrityoma Amritangamaya Asatoma Sakamaya Tamasoma Joy Tigamaya Mrityoma Amritangamaya Asatoma Sakamaya Tamasoma Joy Tigamaya Mrityoma Amritam Gamaya Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Bring your hands into Anjali and Buddha, bow your head. Um, we offer your practice today to someone who's shown you unconditional love, a human being, an animal being, or a nature being. Visualize them, dedicate your practice to them. Namaste. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. So <laughs> we will continue with our exploration of the mantra Om in meditation. Last week, we talked about Om in some depth, the meaning of Om, and the three phases of Om that we use um, in meditation, out loud, whispering, and then silently repeating the mantra. And we're going to do the same thing again today. But we're going to use the visual aid also of Yantra. So each one of you will have a Yantra on the wall. And at the end of the class, we'll all sit in front of a Yantra. And we will use the Yantra as an aid to our meditation. So a Yantra, this particular Yantra is the Yantra for the mantra Om. So the Yantra is like a mandala. It's a geometric structure that um, contains a sound vibration. And when you first look at something like this, it kind of looks like just a pretty pattern. But mm, it's like when you're initiated and you understand what the yantra is, and you're also initiated into the mantra, in other words, you're using the mantra for a spiritual practice, what this Yantra does is it comes to life, and you'll see this, you'll experience this when we do the meditation. So, usually, meditation is done with the eyes closed, but there are some instances which we call tratak, where the meditation is done with the eyes open. So, the classic uh, tratak is when you do it staring at the brightest part of a candle flame. And you may have seen that. You can actually buy stands where you have a candle on for Tratak. It can also be done um, with a flower. It can be done with a dot on the wall, just a simple dot, which is the way they do it in Zen. Uh, if you go in a Zendo, uh, in Zen tradition, you'll just see all the cushions around the wall. 
like facing the wall and then there's just little dots on the wall everybody meditates on the dot <laughs> and the dot is called the bindu and you can also do it on a deity form it can be a whatever it is in if you have a tradition or faith it can be a picture it can be a murti a statue there's many different forms that you can use for meditation and of course this is a very ancient thing in many traditions and icons and in the christian church and the russian orthodox church are very big and still use extensively to this to this day for prayer and meditation so it's a kind of same kind of idea but a yantra is not actually a depiction uh it's a depiction of a vibration of a sound and so this yantra will resonate with the mantra om it contains a lot of shakti a lot of power and it's something that you can manifest um, with meditation on that symbol. But we'll, we'll do it at the end and you'll ex actually experience it rather than me sort of talking too much about it. I will talk more um, about the kind of esoteric nature of meditation on the mantra Om and the still point of the turning world, which is the bindu in the center of the yantra. So in the center of each yantra, there is a dot. And that dot is called a bindu. And a bindu is a Sanskrit word for seed. And the seed is the seed of consciousness, which is resident in every being and everything. This is um, from T.S. Eliot. And this is uh, Four Quartets, Bernd Norton. And I will read from uh, verse two. At the still point of the turning world, neither flesh nor fleshness, neither from nor towards, at the still point, there the dancers, but neither arrest nor movement. And do not call it fixity, where past and future are gathered, neither movement from nor towards, neither ascent nor decline, except for the point, the still point, there would be no dance, and there is only the dance. Time past and time future allow but a little consciousness. To be conscious is not to be in time, but only in time can the moment in the rose garden, the moment in the arbor where the rain beat, the moment in the drafty church at Smokefall be remembered. Involved with past and future, only through time, time is conquered. Have you got that? <laughs> At the still point of the turning world, neither flesh nor fleshless, neither from nor towards, at the still point, there the dancers, but neither arrest nor movement. At the still point of the turning world, which is the point, the bindu, the point of consciousness, which resides in all beings, in every one of us, at that still point, there the dance, there the reality is. Mm -hmm. But in most of our lives, what's happening is we're in the dance of the external world, are we not? It's going on around us all the time, and that's the dance we're having every day in our minds, in our bodies, in our lives, in our relationships, in our interactions with the world and others. But even within that activity of everyday life, there's still the seat of consciousness. And the question is for the spiritual aspirant, for the yogi, how connected can we be with that still point where the dance is throughout our daily lives? Is it something that we miss or is it something that we can connect to moment to moment in our lives? So that the still point isn't something which is elusive, the deep level of a consciousness of feeling of attentiveness of awareness of compassion isn't something which is just always slipping away from us but something that we can hold something that can protect us something that can make us feel whole that is what we're looking for in a spiritual practice and that is what we're looking for in meditation so this bindu this point this om with which we're meditating is that still point it's beyond the mind it's, it's, T.S. Eliot goes on to, here to say, it's like, it's neither ascent nor decline. It's 
where past and future are gathered. It's like a point where everything comes to rest. And in that point, there's no time, there's no past, there's no present, there's no, no past, there's no future, there's just the present moment. And you're totally in the present moment. And in that, so when you're totally in the present moment, there's stillness in the mind. There's no more worry, there's no more fear, there's no more anxiety, there's no more like, there's no more dislike, there's no more clamor. There's just peace of mind. That's the still point of the turning world. Time past and time future allow but a little consciousness. So consciousness is there always in the living human, but it's like, how connected are we to that? To be conscious is not to be in time, but only in time can the moment in the rose garden, the moment in the arbor where the rain beat, the moment in the drafty church at Smokeful be remembered. <laughs> so he's saying that the world is beautiful. And so the spiritual life isn't a rejection of the everyday world. Those things that he's describing, the arbor, and he talks a lot about gardens and about the sea and about, he talks a lot about nature in other words. So nature and this connection to the bindu and the meditation and the symbol om, that is all one energy. It's all one thing. And we have to be connected to that in order to survive and live our lives, don't we? But he's saying, Take it further and see the beauty in everything. Don't get confused by the hubbub of everyday life. But see that everything is a manifestation of the mantra Om or of the divine consciousness in whatever form that manifests for you. Every being, everything. But only in time can the moment in the rose garden, the moment in the arbor where the rain beat, the moment in the drafty church at Smokefall be remembered, involved with past and future. Only through time is time conquered. So how do we get to this place? How do we, how do we get to this place to where, the, where time is conquered? Through meditation through contemplation, through prayer. And when we conquer time, then we're free. <laughs> it's so great. It's amazing. So like we conquer time through meditation because in meditation, there's no time. There's just the present. And then we're free of time. And when we're free of time, we're free of worry. That's simple. That's where there's peace of mind. And the way you get become free of time is to be free of thoughts. How does one become free of thoughts? By placing the mind on one thought. You place, replace the mind on one thought and you train the mind. Eventually the mind becomes comfortable with just one thought. Love, Om, Buddha, whatever. <coughs> You put your mind on that one thought and that one word, that one vibration. And then your mind becomes still and you conquer time because the thoughts are conquered, the time is conquered. And then you rest in thought-free silence, which is your true nature. <coughs> and that is the still point of the turning world. T.S. Eliot was very heavily influenced by um, Indian spirituality and Indian scriptures. Big fan of the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads. So you see it come through time and time again in his writings, poetry. And um, sometimes I find it, it's in poetic language, it's sometimes in mysterious language, but sometimes I find it more direct in its explanation of yogic principles and the scriptures. Mm. So it's worth looking at. Four Quartets is, is a yogic scripture for me. <laughs> Namaste. 
in come to the center of your mat and stand in Tadasan. <clears throat> and then you want to stagger yourselves a little bit on your mat. And if you're really close to the wall, it's best to turn in to the face the center of the room so you can bring your arms really wide. Lift your chest, drop your shoulders down, and then come into your Ujjayi breathing, slight constriction at the base of your throat. And just connect to that little hissing sound to the breath, which is actually the prayer of the practice, mantra of the practice. Inhale, and the breath makes a so sound. And as you exhale, it makes a hum sound. So hum is the mantra om and the sound of the breath. So hum. Just keep coming back to that mantra throughout your practice. Your chest is up and your chin is down. And you're gazing into Ridea, center of your chest, in line with your heart. Be conscious that is where the breath is manifesting from. And it's also the place to where the breath returns. Has the vinyasas. As you begin the next inhale, start the breath and then raise the arms on the breath, wide and overhead. Interlock your fingers and flip your palms and lift up gently as you bring the chin down, gaze into the heart. Feel the lower abdomen lengthen, lift out of your hips and pause. And then begin to exhale and lower the arms on the breath. And inhale, raise. <laughs> Interlock the fingers the other way around. Lift up a little more. Look into the heart. Eyes can be closed. And then exhale, just bring the thumbs to the back of your neck. Palms up. Completely empty your lungs. Draw the elbows back. Hold the breath out. Banders, perineum lifts. Lower abdomen and up. Chin down. Release the banders, inhale, push the hands to the ceiling. And slowly exhale, widen down. Inhale, forward and up, palms down. Get to the end of the movement, stretch and try and lift through the back of your lungs. And exhale, forward and down. Inhale, widen up. Interlock the fingers. Exhale, twist to the right. The end of the breath, arch back, look up past the hands. Inhale, come to the center, chin down, lift. Try to keep the length, exhale, twist the other way. Arch back, look up. Inhale to center. Exhale, widen down. Keep your chin down, keep looking into the ridea. Inhale, widen overhead. Do some Tadasana variation. Exhale, lift your heels. Balance. Just gaze at the floor in front of you. And then inhale, lower your heels. And exhale, lower your arms. Inhale, raise the arms.
Exhale, lift the heel slowly. Balance. Go to the end of the breath. Inhale, slowly lower the heels. Lift up. Keep the length in the spine. Exhale, slowly lower the arms. All the movements synchronize with the Ujjayi breathing. Inhale, raise the arms. And as you do it this time, lift the heels at the same time. Hold, exhale there. Hold the breath out, Bayakumbaka, external retention. Inhale. And slowly exhale, lower the arms and lower the heels. Close your eyes, look into the heart. Ujjayi breathing. Come to the front of your mat for Surya Namaskar. Inhale. Exhale, Anjali Mudra. Inhale, widen overhead, flip your palms, chin down. Exhale, hips back, fold forward, chin on the chest. All the way down, hands to the floor. Bend the knees if you need to. Inhale there. Exhale, look up and squat down. Body in a little ball, heels may rise. Inhale into the back of the heart. Hold the breath, hop or step back. Chaturanga, or bring the knees down, lower halfway. All the way to the floor, inhale, full prostration. Bring the hands back, Chaturanga, or your variation, sorry. And then inhale, upward facing dog. Exhale, downward facing dog. Empty the lungs, banders. Hop or step forward, squat down, Ilkatasan. Heels may rise. Sink the seat as low as you can. Let the heels come up, Barbara. Yes. And inhale, straighten the legs, keep the body close to the legs. Exhale, fold deeply. Completely empty the lungs, strong legs, strong arms, flip the palms, come all the way up. Chin down. Exhale, Anjali Mudra. And stand in Tadasana. Inhale. Exhale, Anjali Mudra. Inhale, widen overhead, flip your palms. Exhale, fold forward. Inhale. Exhale, Ukatasan. Keep the lower abdomen firm. Inhale into the back of the heart. Just a little breath. Hold the breath. Hold back Chaturanga. Resist as you lower and don't go too low. Then all the way to the floor, full prostration, feet together, palms together, forehead on the floor. Om Pushni Namaha. Exhale back, Chaturanga. No rush. You want to try and feel the pause at the end of the breath in each movement. And inhale forward to upward facing dog with the chin down. 
Try and really drag your spine long. Exhale, downward facing dog. So long exhale. Empty the lungs. Engage your banders and try and keep them as you step or hop forward onto Utkatasana. And that Utkatasana eases a little more air out of the lungs until you're really empty. And you find the connection to the perineum. And you straighten the legs with a short inhale. And then with a long exhale, you fold deeply. When the lungs are empty, you firm the legs, interlock the fingers and with strong arms and legs lift all the way up. And you stretch up strong as you bring the chin down more. And exhale, Anjali Mudra, gaze into the heart. Turn to the right, stand in Tadasan. Feet together. Inhale, arms go level. Exhale. You swap, Sabrina. Hop or step the feet apart, triangle distance. Turn the right foot out and the left foot in. Inhale. Exhale, trick and answer to the right. Go down. Gaze at the side wall or the top hand. Inhale, come up with the breath. Switch the feet, exhale to the left. Just keep that UJ breath nice and smooth so it's it's the thing that's moving you, really, this breath. Inhale, come up. So just like you did the Hasta Vinyasas, it's the breath that moves the body. Turn the feet, go to the right. So you just want to get into the habit of flipping the feet really quickly and gracefully. And inhale, come up. And exhale to the left. Try to get a little firmer in the legs, a little more connected to the um, Mula Banda each time. And inhale, come up. And exhale, change. Hold the three steady breaths. You can look at the top hand or you can look at the side wall. Actually, today, just bring the top hand down behind you and see if you can hook it over your top thigh. If you can bring your hand down to the floor, do it. And push into the hand. Send the energy back through the body and through the pelvis into the back foot. So you have equal weight in both feet. Keep opening the chest. Keep your back foot turned in, Jane. And then inhale, stretch your top arm up and come up. And exhale, switch your feet and go down to the left. Take a breath, and then on the next exhale, bring your right hand down behind you. Try to keep your chest as open as you can and body as flat as you can make it. So if your hand's on the floor, but your chest is dropping, then come up and work at flattening your body out more. Good. Tailbone tucked towards the pubic bone for Mula Bandha. Good. Then inhale, stretch your top arm up. Exhale and inhale, come up. Exhale, bring the hands to the waist. Trikonasana Stiti, turn the feet to 30 degrees. And inhale, lengthen your stance six to 12 inches. Turn your right foot out and your left foot in sharply. And inhale, raise the arms to shoulder level. Keep the hips facing the long side of your mat. And exhale, bend the front knee for warrior two. Keep the back body strong. Keep the back leg strong. And don't let the left hip drop forward. Keep drawing it back. Inhale, come up. You bend the front knee this time. Make sure it tracks through the center of your foot. Exhale, bend the knee through the center of your foot. 
Good, inhale, come up. Exhale, go down. Hold, three breaths. Keep a straight line through the shoulders, gaze over the front hand, pass the middle finger to the horizon line. And then bend the front knee more by stretching more into the back arm and the back leg. So you don't lean forward. Put your fingers together. And breathe. Inhale, come up. Exhale, hands to the waist. Switch the feet. Inhale, raise the arms to shoulder level. Exhale, bend the front knee. Keep the knee in the center of the foot. Inhale, come up. Ujjayi breathing. Exhale, down. Try to go a bit deeper each time. Try to get stronger in the back body each time. Inhale, come up. Exhale, down. Do one more vinyasa. There's a lot of right hips dropping forward. Try to keep your right hip back so you open your hips. Exhale, go down last time and hold. Good. Lift your lower abdomen, tuck your tailbone towards your pubic bone, Mula Bandha. You have to work the back body more than you think. Keep your shoulders over your hips. Ujjayi breathing, keep that arm straight. Move your front knee to the left. No, not your foot. It's your knee. <laughs> Inhale, come up. Exhale, turn the feet 30 degrees, hands to the waist. Good. Inhale, arms level. Exhale. You can move back a bit away from the wall. And then inhale, turn the palms up, open the chest and look up. Arch back. As you exhale, fold forward by just drawing your hips back. Lead with your heart. Bring your hands down and hold your heels or the outside of your legs. From the outside. And then inhale, arms wide like wings flow all the way up. Rotate the palms up, arch back, look up. Exhale down. Hold the heels or the legs. Inhale, a little look up. Exhale, fold. Don't struggle, work with a long exhale. Completely relax your neck and get to the tip of your nose so there's no tension in the neck. <laughs> yeah. And then hold your legs. And just move your elbows out. No, keep holding your legs. Grip. Move your elbows out like that. <laughs> Head down. <laughs> And then inhale, hands on the floor under your shoulders. And exhale. Bring your hands forward. So not between your feet now, forward. So you've got equal weight in your hands and your feet. And your arms are straight, Sarah. Hands forward under your shoulders. Good. Exhale. When you get to the end of the exhale, hold the breath out and transfer the weight your hands and your feet together. Mm. Now squat down. Heels may rise, but if you can keep the feet on the floor, separate and fold down inside your knees. And then you can stay there, or you can bring your sweep your arms underneath your shins and hold your heels. And if you can hold your heels, take a big exhale. And fold forward and see if you can put your head on the floor. Just do what you can. You can just be in the squat might be enough for you. Kumasana, tortoise pose. And then inhale and look up, release the hands, put them back where they were under your shoulders. Exhale, inhale, straighten your legs. Exhale, fold into the legs. 
the pill palms inhale stand up and exhale prayer to the heart turn to face front inhale bend the right knee to your chest Exhale, take the right ankle in the right hand, squeeze the knees together, Nataraja. Choose a point of focus on the floor in front of you that won't move, about three, four feet away. Lift up through the left arm. And as you do that, squeeze the right heel into the buttock and move the right knee back so the knees are in line and you feel the stretch in your quadricep. Inhale. Exhale, fold forward. You can do it with fingers on the wall if you're struggling with your balance. Lift the back foot up and away from the body, Fiona. <laughs> Find a bit of wall and put your fingers on the wall and do it if you want. Okay, I'll bend the standing leg, bring the fingertips to the floor and lift the top foot higher. Most of you were thinking it was all over. It's actually just beginning. <laughs> Relax the neck and look at the standing foot. Come on. And then inhale, <laughs> soften the standing knee and come up to where you started. Stretch up. <laughs> exhale, standing to that. No. Yeah. Okay. Better luck on the next side. Okay. Inhale, bend the left knee, hug the knee to the chest. Exhale, hold the foot. Inhale, stretch the right arm up. Nataraja, the dancing Shiva. And you, that, you know, just do what you can. Don't go crazy. And then, then exhale and you can bend the knee and bring the right hand to the floor if you can, if you want to go further. And it wants to be slightly outside the line of the foot. Yes. And then look at the standing foot and push the back foot up. Top foot up, I should say. And if you can, do it without letting your knee go out too much to the side. It's not easy. And then soften the standing knee and inhale, come up. Try to keep your balance. Keep your gaze steady on the point. And then out at asana. <laughs> Okay, side two is a huge improvement on side one. There's dancing Shiva. <laughs> Very graceful. <laughs> Practice it. So the way to do it, if you're, if you're finding that a challenge, uh, that Nataraja, is to just do it with your fingertips on the wall, work out the distance and start doing it with the fingertips on the wall. And with that balance, you can start to lift the back foot more because you're trying to get in the same sort of position as you would be in bow pose when you're laying on the floor and you lift your, on your stomach and you lift your legs up, but you're just doing one leg at a time. And with fingertips on the wall, when you forget having to sort of worry about your balance, you can actually work on the structure a bit more. And then the thing of bringing the hand down is when you're, you've got to be fairly comfortable in your balance to do that. But when you do get down there and then you lift the foot higher, you get a more sort of stronger opening from that. Challenges your balance as well, going up and down, which is always good. Down in Tadasana at the front of your mat, lead and return sequence. Inhale. Exhale, look hard. Inhale, arms widen overhead, flip your palms. Exhale, separate the palms, palms face forward. And then from the upper back and shoulders, arch back as you inhale, keeping the chin down. Exhale, hips back, fold all the way. Good. Fingertips to the floor. Now just inhale and look up there. And exhale, fold. If you can, press your hands into the floor or hold onto your legs. And inhale, look up. Lengthen the spine. Exhale, fold. Long breath out. One more time. Inhale, look up. Exhale, fold. 
all the air out of the lungs, completely empty, hands on the floor, squat down, exhale, sit down, Dandasan. Inhale, arms over your head, flip your palms. Exhale, don't move. Inhale, roll down onto your back, arms over your head. Exhale, arms beside your body. And take rest. Switch off Ujjayi breathing, gaze down into your heart center. The eyes are turned down in the sockets with the eyes closed. You're looking into the center of your chest. Watch your breath come from there. Watch your return to there. Try to re relax the day with your feet together. Your arms by your sides, close to the body, trying to hold the center line, hold the prana in the center of the body. If you find that a real challenge for your legs to do that, then work at just rotating the femurs in from the hip joint so that you aren't just trying to force the feet together, but the rotation comes from the joint. And inhale, interlock the fingers, bring the arms over the head. Flip the palms, push the palms away. Bring the hands all the way to the floor, Jessica. No, the other way, over your head. <laughs> Flex both feet, draw the lower back into the floor, turn your gaze down into the center of your body in line with your navel. Somebody said to me the other day, all this time you've been saying navel, what is navel? <laughs> I said, your belly button. I said, oh, the belly button, right, okay. So if you're not sure what I'm on about, the navel is your belly button. I've been coming for about a year. <laughs> anyway, start again. Inhale, bring the arms up and over the head. Move those blocks out. You need your arms symmetrical. Everything in yoga needs to be as symmetrical as possible. Okay, flex the feet, lower back. Go on down, empty the lungs. Take a normal inhale. Look into the center of the body in line with the belly button. And a long exhale. And keep exhaling until there's nothing left. Hold the breath out, back and back. Huh? Pull the lower abdomen in and up. Lift the pelvic floor. Feel the abdomen tuck in and up towards the heart. Gaze into the navel. And then inhale there, long of a breath maybe, a little more stretch maybe for the lungs. And then turn the gaze down, same thing, empty the lungs. If you flex the feet and consciously draw the lower back down, it will deepen the pond in your belly. You want two ponds in your eyes and a pond in your mouth. Everything's relaxed. And inhale, bring the hands up over your face. Exhale, bend the knees and hug the knees to the chest. Good. Inhale there. Exhale, lift the forehead towards the knees. Hold the breath out, squeeze the knees down. Cross the ankles, hold the feet or hold the knees. Inhale, rock up, exhale, rock back or come to a sitting position. Do it three times, trying to round your spine. Massage your whole spine. And then come all the way up and take Dandasana, both legs straight. So that rolling technique is a preliminary phase to, you, there's a technique that you do where you, from that rolling, you start to do it with the legs straight. And you come, you, you, you start from your back, you lift the legs, you go over into plow. And then you inhale, come up and you go to the forward bend. And then you inhale and come back to plow. And then you, cut, you just keep doing it. So you're doing forward bend, dandasan, plow, forward bend, up, dandasan, plow. And you do it in a sequence, like it's a rolling sequence. And Ramaswamy has you doing it for ages. And then eventually 
what you do is you go from the plow and you just keep going. You put the hands on the floor and you jump straight back from plow into chaturanga. Can you do that, Sabrina? <laughs> can you, Robert? <laughs> okay, well, we can do it. We can another day we'll do the actual roll at the, the plow. We've done that several times. We'll do the rolling to forward bend. But if you're really comfortable and you like that forward, uh, you know, that rolling motion for your spine, you can actually keep going back until you get to the plow. And then when you come out of the plow, you come all the way to the forward bend. And it's a very nice way of preparing for forward bends as well, because the plow is a forward bend, isn't it? It's just an upside down forward bend. So it really loosens up your spine. If your back's tight, uh, for whatever reason, or you, I like to find it particularly good. Like the other day, I spent all day walking around London. And then I do that before I do my shoulder stand. It really loosens the spine up. It's good. I'm talking, we should be doing it really, but we can do something else. <laughs> yeah, we'll do it another day. Okay, bring the legs really wide apart. And make some space. If you need to sit on a block or bend the knees slightly. Okay. Wish to Kanasana Vinyasas, inhale, bring the arms up over your head. You can always bend the knees a little bit if you can't get any forward movement. And the first movement is to separate the palms and fold straight forward. Nobody cares how far you go down. And then flip the palms and inhale, come up, sorry. Yeah, you can, you can bend your back as you go down. And exhale, fold forward. You can round the back. As you get further down, you let the head go heavy and you round the back. Okay, I need to explain something. Everybody come up. So it's a fundamental question which relates to the practice of vinyasa prama. Should I round my back? So when you go down into a forward bend in a lot of traditional vinyasa yoga, not traditional, in a lot of modern vinyasa yoga, the instruction is to keep the back spine straight. Yes, keep the back flat. So that's a more modern invention. There's nothing wrong with it. It's like perfectly fine to do that but what happens when you bend down and you keep your spine completely flat is all, all the extension goes into the hamstrings and it's very strong on the hamstrings you you know and you've got to really be working your legs properly engaging the quadriceps well to to avoid overstretching the hamstrings and especially the hamstring attachments and if you're a really super flexible sort of yogi person then you're not going to have a problem but for a lot of people it is a problem because it's too intense in the hamstring attachments. That's the anatomical reason. But the, uh, and also when the spine is slightly bent, then you're stretching the whole of the back of the body. When the body is completely flat, and especially if you lift the head to look at the feet, what you're doing is you're compressing the cervical part of the spine and the upper back. So it's not a Paschimottanasana in that it's not a stretch for the whole spine. The moment you allow the back to slightly round and the head to go down, the gaze to go into the navel, what you're doing is you're opening up all the upper surface of the vertebrae of the spine. Does that make sense? Which is different to having the back flat when you fold forward. If you know, It's different for different people, but it's the general way. So in Vinyasa Krama, which you're doing, the back always rounds in a forward bet. <clears throat> the exception being Mahamudra. Yeah? If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. But all the other forward bends, the back rounds when you go down and the head drops. So there's no shortening of the cervical spine and compression in the neck. It's always down because the mama, where are you gazing in a forward bend? There's two, two gaze points for in a forward bend. Nabi, navel or belly button and perineum. Perineum, you know where the perineum is, yeah? in between the anus and the genitals. So they're the two points that you put the gaze in forward bends in this practice. <clears throat> and you can only do that if your back is round and your head is down. Does that make sense? Yes, Sabrina. Yeah, so when you first move into a forward bend, the, the, where's, the movement is coming from your hips, yes? That's the first movement that happens when you fold forward. And so when you start to fold forward, your spine's straight. But you get to a point where the hip, the ro hip rotation in the hip stops, yes? And then what happens? If you keep your back straight and you keep 
forcing yourself to fold forward, the pressure goes into your hamstring and your hamstring attachment. But the moment you round the back, you still got the extension in the hamstrings, but the stretch goes through the gluteal muscles and through the lower back muscles. And so it's like a stages. You fold from the hips, and then when the hips don't fold, you start to round the back. And then when the back doesn't go round anymore, the head goes down. And that extends the whole of your spine and opens up the chain of muscles through the whole back of the body. Am I making sense? So that's very important in forward bend especially in forward bends that when the legs are wide because sometimes that's a you know more this is why i never you, you know yogis if you're a yoga teacher avoid assisting people in straddle forward bends seated forward bends because that's where the majority of hamstring tears come from so the other thing in this posture is and all four bends while we're on the subject <coughs> is like when you fold forward the most important thing, there's two really important things about folding forward in a forward bend. And one is the action through the feet, and one is the way you use with J breath. So the action through the feet in a forward bend is that the you push out through the ball of the foot. Okay. You don't flex the feet back, and so you're pushing out through the heel and you don't point the toe. You push out through the ball of the foot. So the ball of the foot becomes the point that's furthest forward, the same as you do in a shoulder stand and a headstand, yes? And what that does is it engages the front of the leg as well as the back of the leg, which gives support to the connective tissue and the muscles in the back of the leg. The moment you let the foot go forward and release, when you fold, you'll put all the much more weight into the hamstring. Does that make sense? So you really want that before you go down into any forward bend, and you'll often find this if you're not thinking, and then you start to fold, you'll feel slightly vulnerable as you fold. You feel you haven't got a lot of stability, and it's because you're not using the legs correctly, or what, a leg if you're folding over one leg. Does that make sense? And so you, it's really, really important that you do that. And the other thing is, in order to be able to maintain that stability, you have to fold with a strong J breath. So if you just uh, breathe out into a four bend, you put the chain of muscles that you're stretching often don't have time to protect themselves and connect. But if you use slow J, you'll be able to fold into a forward bend which, and you'll get more extension and more opening because you go in more slowly. If you go in fast, the muscles tend to fire and contract more. Whereas if you go in with slow J controlled breathing, the muscles will stabilize and allow you to stretch them. What the hell? Okay. Yeah, who, who asked that question? Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. No, this is good though, isn't it? It's interesting, yeah. what do you think? And I haven't even got into the um, sort of pranic effects of why you've been, but we'll do that another day. Yeah, that, we, we could be here all night. Yes. So let's do it again and try and think about what we're doing. Inhale, raise the arms overhead. Pushing out through the balls of the feet. And then slowly, Ujjayi breath strong, fold forward. See if you can feel the difference. Keep those legs really active. Hands to the floor, wherever you are. And then flip the palms and inhale, come up on one, on two, on three, on four, chins down, on five. And inhale there. Oh, that is an inhale. Exhale, go down on one, on two, on three, on four, on five, on six, on seven, on eight. Push out for the balls of the feet. Make sure the quadriceps are toned. Inhale, come up. On one, on two, on three, on four, on five, turn to the right. Exhale, fold over the right. Two, on three, on four. Keep exhaling, sweep to the left. On five, on six, on seven, on eight. Inhale up. On one, on two. On three, on four, pause, turn to the right. 
Exhale down on one, on two, on three, on four across, on five, on six, on seven, on eight. Inhale on one, up, two, on three, on four, turn to center, pause. To the left, exhale, turn, and fold, you count. On four, down, to eight, across, all on the long exhale, and then short inhale, four on the way up. Pause at the top, chin down, stretch, then to the left, you're in control. When you sweep across, try and reach out. And then finally exhale and fold forward again. And you might find a difference in the way and the control and the movement you have forward after working into the rotation of your hips. Round the back, gaze into your navel. Hands are on the floor now. You're just folding straight forward. Back's rounded, eyes closed, look navel. Push out through balls of feet. Double the length of your exhale. Somebody said to me the other day, Blimey, all the things you've got to remember, why is yoga so complicated? And I said, it's because you're complicated. Simple. Often isn't enough. Principles are actually simple, but you just have to learn them first. Flip the palms, inhale, come up. Exhale, hands behind your 10 inches. If your legs are really wide, I encourage you to bring together a little bit to protect yourself from injury. And then on the inhale, lift the hips up, drop the head back, squeeze the shoulder blades, push the feet down. And exhale, come down. One more time. Inhale, come up. And push the feet into the floor. Squeeze the buttocks. Exhale, come down. Good. Bring the feet together. And exhale. Stand, uh, sit in the Dandasana. Good. Inhale, bring the arms over your head. And exhale, fold forward and take the big toes with the first two fingers of both hands, even if you have to bend the knees. Good. And then keep the chest up now and keep the head up. And do Akunchasana, shooting bow pose. And then bend the right knee slightly, holding the big toe. And then pick the big toe up and draw it right back towards your right ear. Knee goes outside and lift the foot up as high as you can as if you're answering an old fashioned telephone. And then inhale, push the foot forward a little bit and exhale, draw it back. That's the vinyasa. Keep hold of the leg or the foot on the left, grip on top, foot away. Exhale, bend it back. And inhale, push it forward. Good. And then exhale, bring it back and just hold for a breath. Doesn't matter if you're not holding the floor on that side. And then inhale, just straighten your right leg as straight up as you can get it and hold the foot or the leg with both hands. And inhale there, exhale, round your back and curl into the leg. Good, shoulders down, elbows wide. Take a breath there, inhale. And then keep your head on the shin or very close to the leg if you can. And as you exhale, fold forward. Use a strong exhale to control your descent and keep the other leg strong. So you're now doing a forward bend over one leg, holding that foot or leg with both hands. A couple of breaths there. Long exhale. And then release the foot. Interlock the fingers. Inhale, come up. Exhale, go down, take big toes with both hands. And inhale. 
and exhale, draw the left foot back towards your ear. Chest up, bring the foot high. Exhale, move it forward. Two maybe. Exhale back. Good. Inhale forward. Exhale back. Hold for breath. Pretend you're enjoying it, even if you're not. <laughs> and then hold the leg or the foot with both hands. Straighten the leg. Round the right leg, inhale, exhale, fold into the leg. Good. Take an inhale there. And then exhale slowly with strong OJ, fold over that one leg. Ardha Pashimottanasana, half forward fold. Take a couple of breaths there of that one leg. So you're slightly twisted in the forward bend. How you doing, Anne? Good, you're doing well. <laughs> Flip your palms, inhale, come up. Exhale, fold over both legs. Take any hand hold and take three breaths. The exhales are twice as long as the inhales. If you're not familiar with that, count the OM numbers. Optional band at the end of the exhale. When you've done your three breaths, inhale, sit up, take Badakanasana, cobbler pose with the soles of the feet together. You flip the palms, come to Dandasana first, remember. And then bring the arms down, knees wide, soles of the feet together, butterfly pose. I've no idea what that means, butterfly pose. And then inhale, lift your chest. And exhale, bring your chin down, look into your heart. And concentrate on your Ujjayi breathing. Chest is up, chin is down. And then cross your ankles, put your hands on the floor, step back or hop back and lower to Chaturanga. Inhale forward to upward facing dog and exhale to downward facing dog. Empty the lungs, hop halfway down the mat onto your shins. Sit up and measure your elbows with the knuckles around the outside of your arms. <clears throat> you don't want to be right on the front of your mat, you want to be back a bit so that when you bring your hands down, you're on your mat. And then bring your elbows to the floor. Open your hands and interlock your fingers. Make sure the wrists and the palms are vertical and the hands are the shape of the back of your head. Bring your head down between your forehead and your crown. So there's a little bit of space between the back of the head and the hands. Good. Don't let your elbows go out, Linda. Keep them under your shoulders. Turn your toes under. Lift your shoulders up away from the floor by pushing into your elbows and forearms. And then lift your knees up. Heads on the floor. And walk your feet gently with the legs straight towards your face a little bit. Then push your hips to the ceiling. Lift your shoulders towards the ceiling and stay in that half headstand or come into full headstand. And if you need help, let me know. You're safe. Mm -hmm. Take a couple of breaths, lift your shoulders. 
นแน่นอนนินทาเป็นกระแลกสอง Good. Lift your shoulders. Find your balance. Find your breath. I won't let you fall. You're safe. Try to find your balance there. And then, if you have had enough of the half headstand, you can come down and rest in child's pose. Well done. And then, take your time when you're all ready. Come down and rest in shavasana. <laughs> done. Yeah, I'll have a look at it another time. Well done. Well done. We're just going to do a short relaxation before meditation. Come onto your back. If you need something under your head, raise your head a little bit. Feel free. Feet wider than your hips, arms away from your body. Roll your head from side to side and relax. Switch off the deep breathing. The UJ sound disappears. Turn your gaze down into the center of your chest. Just watch where the breath comes from, where the breath, re breath returns. Palms face up, please. So you have the shoulders kind of released back and down. And your feet apart now, slightly wider than your hips. So your hips can relax. Deep in your breath. Feet together, arms by your sides. Inhale, arms over your head. Bend your knees, hug your knees. Make your way into a seated position and fold your mat in half so you've got a bit more padding and place your mat in front of the yantra. And you want to be about arm's length from the yantra. And the yantra wants to be about eye level. The center of the yantra. It should be enough. So just find yourself.
So you can be kneeling or cross-legged. A comfortable meditation pose for you. Higher. Your knees aren't up so much. Okay, sit up as much as you can, Barbara. Your back is more relaxed, not rounding. So you can put your feet out in front of you, but sit high. It'll make it easier. That's it. Okay. I'll guide you through the meditation. We start by chanting Om together. You're looking at the manifestation of OM as a geometric form. Close your eyes. Relax your forehead. All the muscles around your eyes. Drop the upper palate and release the soft palate and the tongue. Jaws relax, shoulders are down, inner front spine lengthens, connection to the sit bones is just acknowledged, and the head is balanced so it feels weightless. Remember how we chant the OM with the three sounds starting in the solar plexus, moving up through the spine through the upper palate and into the third eye. Inhale deeply for Aum. Continue to repeat the mantra silently on the inhale and on the natural exhale of your breath. The breath is very shallow and light. No effort in your breath. And just let the mantra and the breath become one. And then very slowly open your eyes.
And just let your gaze rest on the dot in the center of the antra. The gaze should be receptive, not hungry. So you're receiving the image into your eyes. Your eyes are very relaxed, almost soft focus. The lids are a little bit heavy. So there's no tension in your eye muscles. Just simply rest your gaze on the bindu and continue to mentally repeat your mantra. Avoid excessive blinking. And if your gaze starts to wander to other parts of the yantra, just very gently return it to the bindu. The essence of the mantra Om and the Bindu at the center of the yantra are the same vibration. The process of meditation is to continually return the mind to the point of focus, visually or mentally, with no struggle or judgment. with a total acceptance of the present moment.
And very gently close your eyes. And just accept whatever appears in the screen of your forehead to continue to repeat your mantra. And hold the awareness a little bit in your third eye center. And there's no effort of concentration mind and the muscles in the face and eyes are completely relaxed. And gently open your eyes and begin to gaze again at the yantra. Then close your eyes, continue with the mantra. Rest your awareness in your third eye, center of the skull in line with your eyebrows. And just allow that space to flood with a soft white light like a full moon. The third eye is the seat of the mantra Om. Rest in the moon, repeat the mantra in the moon. You can just have the feeling of letting the eyes recede back deeply into your skull. It helps to open the space for the actual chakra. And then let go of the repetition of the mantra Om, but just listen and hear the mantra Om.
So exhale, drop the prana into your heart. Let go of the mantra and begin to deepen your breath. Bring your hands into Anjali Mudra, bow your head. Inhale deeply for Om. yourself the intention you made for your practice. Om Namah Shivaya, Namaste. And to turn to face inwards. Okay, so I'll tell you now what this actually is. It's a portal. It's a portal into another dimension of consciousness, awareness. And the key to unlocking the door to that portal is the mantra. When you become intimate with the yantra and then you use the mantra often enough so it becomes embedded in your consciousness it will take you to a deeper dimension of reality which in yoga we call turiya when we're talking about the mantra om and i talked about that last week the state of consciousness in which there's no separation remember that's what that does it's a tool the word yan means like tool and tra means transcendence so it's a tool that takes you into a state of transcendence where you go beyond the normal activity and fluctuation of the mind. T.S. Eliot talks about it in a different way. He says, I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning rising to meet you or your shadow at evening falling behind you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. <laughs> but... It's not the fear, the frightening fear. It's like the fear of losing your everyday reality as you fall into a deeper state of awareness. And in that state is peace. You've heard of peace of mind? It doesn't exist. <laughs> peace of mind is just a state where the mind stops. And that's what this is for. Does that make sense? So it's about learning, you know, it's like something you have to become, you know, I said, I used the word earlier, initiated. So, but what that really means is becoming intimate, becoming intimate with the process. And then you take the journey, like you have to learn. People throughout time have always looked for portals or holes in the, in the, in the reality through which they can see deeper into this world, yes? This always happens, what shamans do, it's what um, psychics do, it's what avatars do, what rishis and sages do, what artists do, what saints do, holy people do. And it's available to us if we want to. How did you get on with the meditation? Any questions or observations? I just want to stop the little thing in the middle, kept bouncing around the middle. 
What the dot was moving. Yeah, the yellow thing. Yeah, and right in the middle. They try. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That there's lots of. Did any of you? Uh, anyone else have movement in the antra? Yeah, that's pretty common. Yeah. So the yantra, it's like when you 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 you, you it's like something you've just switched it on. You've said you've ommed it. <laughs> you've ommed it with your mind, and it's like I I'm on, I'm active, and it and you bring it you bring the antra to life, and the antra will do all sorts of stuff. The antra can dance. The antra can be three dimensional. The antra can change color. The antra can turn into just light. The antra can turn into just black and white. Somebody the other day said it just it was just black and white, and there's no color left. It's just black and white lines. All kinds of things happen in the antra because the antra is energy. It has a psychic power of its own when you feed it with the om, and so that's fine. But and and all these things are kind of what they mean is that you are engaging with, you're activating the form, the antra, and that's good because you're developing a relationship then with the antra, yes? So like you're getting to know it, it's getting to know you, it's a relationship. And then what, ha but what happens is over time when you do it, the, it's like the honeymoon phase is over, you know, like the, the excitement is gone. It doesn't move around so much. It gets more steady, it gets more stable. And the, and the thing that really matters which is the consciousness, the bindu, the the kind of taria, the, the little dot in the middle, that becomes a thing. And it gets so that you can, that's all you see. When you look at the antra, it's like you look at the world and everything's going on, isn't it? All around us all the time, trying to distract us, trying to pull us, trying to get at us, trying to kind of help us, trying to heal us, trying to hurt us, whatever it's doing. But at the center, there's the dot, there's the bindu, there's your consciousness. And it's just saying, come back to me, come back to the center, realign. And when that happens, then the tend of the actual rest of the antra, which represents the earth and represents the circle, represents infinity, and the little petal shapes represent purity, all those things that it represents, they're all still there but you're able to separate yourself and go right to the heart of consciousness. Like Picasso said, I am in the world, but I'm not of the world. I just observe the world. So it's that kind of idea. Yeah? So yeah, dancing, when it does all those things, don't worry about it. The, the one that's the most freaky is when it goes 3D and it comes out, you like that. And you go, oh my God. But that's all fine. It means that you are engaging the antra. Can you say that you have to uh, uh, travel around the outside? Yeah. So that's the other technique. There's two ways of doing this. I'm going to let you go. But there's two ways. The way we did today is the simple, most direct way you just gaze at the dot, and everything else will happen around the dot. But the other way is, not more traditional, it's just another technique, is you go in through the gates, the little bits on the outside, the little sticky out bits are called gates. You go in through the left-hand gate and you work round in a circle, clockwise direction, going through all the levels of the antra until you get to the dot. And it's like you're going through all the different levels and phases of reality and all the different elements that make up the earth, the earth, the green bit on the outside is the earth, and then it goes water, fire, ether, air, space, third eye, om. And so you can do it that way too. But you always end up at the same place. So one question, are there different mantras for different mantras? Yes. So this is, this is the, called Sri. It's a goddess mantra mantra but it's, it's what it is a shakti mantra so it's like energy it's a mantra for energy and the ultimate source of energy is om every other mantra comes from that mm -hmm. so the other mantras like if you chose om namah shivaya i haven't got that one up at the moment um yeah. 
Jim. Sorry? Did you took it down? It yes, it's a bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the other yantras, um, they all start with Om because that's essentially what they are. And what you realize if you use, say, for example, you use the mantra Om Namah Shivaya, that's a different shape. It's three triangles with one triangle down. It's a kind of like Shiva's powerful energy. This is a, the reason we're doing this is because Om and the Sri Yantra is the most accessible and soft for everyone to use at the beginning. But if you ended up deciding that your mantra was going to be Om Dum Durgaya Namaha, then you would have a different Yantra for your deity. And you would, you would fall in love with, you would have a relationship with that uh, form. But it's all Om. It's just manifestations of Om. If you're from another tradition, you know, you, you would gaze at a picture of Mary or Buddha. You get my drift. Yes? But it's a very interesting topic, mandalas and mantras and the way it can be used in meditation and the different energies it creates. It's all essentially uh, aspects of nature, whatever name you give it in the yogic tradition. Namaste.